Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Pathfinder presented by Payload. I am your host, Mo Islam, and today we have Shay Sabrapour on the show, the CEO and founder of Cesium Astro, a developer of software-defined active phase array antennas. A lot to unpack there. We're going to kick things off in just a second, but, but first, a brief word from our sponsor, Spider Oak Mission Systems, a leader in space cybersecurity. Spider Oak's Orbit Secure software is designed for hybrid space operators struggling to manage the chaos of securing data flow and access to and from tens of thousands of small satellites in low Earth orbit. Using a unique combination of end to end zero trust encryption and blockchain distributed ledger, Orbit Secure allows your mission to orchestrate and secure Earth to orbit orbit to earth transmission, communication and storage of sensitive data across even the most complex and unsecure hybrid space environments. To learn how Orbit Secure can bring zero trust security and resiliency to your zero gravity environments, check out Spider Oak at www.spideroak.com. Shay, welcome to the show. Hi Mo, good to see you again. Did I uh, did I get your last name pronunciation right? You did. Okay, good. Um, well, uh, we're going to definitely dive into your background in just a second. Um, what I would say, typically when we have founders on the show, the way I've liked to do things is I you know, typically start off by asking questions about the company itself. But Cesium is technology that I think we have to warm the crowd up to and build up to. So why don't we start off with you and maybe tell us a little bit about the story of how you entered the space industry. Okay, uh, interesting. I mean, I think um, many of uh, many people in my generation got interested in space by uh, uh, by the first uh, trip to the moon with uh, Neil Armstrong, and uh, I watched it as a very young child, and I was incredibly fascinated by it, and I got very interested in space. Um, uh, I uh, went to school, uh, wanted to become an electrical engineer. So when I became an electrical engineer, I wanted to basically be involved in the space industry. I wanted to work for a particular company. Um, and uh, right out of school, I uh, started working for uh, Lockheed Martin Space Systems Company, uh, which uh, in the case of Lockheed Martin Space, uh, it was a culmination of several other companies. So when I started, I was in the Princeton, New Jersey area, uh, worked for a company called RCA Astro Electronics, which became G GE, which became Martin Marietta and ultimately Lockheed Martin. Uh, and I, w I was there for uh, 24 years. Wow. Um, and then what did you do after Lockheed? Uh, after Lockheed, I, uh, uh, in my entrepreneurial <laughs> experience, uh, I wanted to uh, try and build a company. And uh, initially, I joined a startup uh, rocket company in Austin uh, called Firefly. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I was one of the early employees. I was their chief technology officer. and. Uh, we grew the team uh, to about 160 people. And then, of course, uh, the first revision of Firefly uh, I ran out of funds. Uh, they're, of course, they're back in business and very successful. But mm -hmm. after that, I started Cesium Astro in January of 2017. Okay. So um, were you, did you have a sense of, um, well, I, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly get into going from a, a, a rocket company to building um, I guess components for sat for for satellite technology in just a second, but maybe maybe let's uh, l let's maybe tackle the, the the cesium question now, which is mm -hmm. you know give us a little bit of overview of you know what the company does the, and and ultimately you know what the mission is. Right, um, you know just to give you a little background, uh, when um, when I first uh, started at uh, Lockheed Martin Space. Uh, uh, I was first a, a design engineer, and I worked on a number of components and so on. And then ultimately, uh, I, I was very fascinated about this technology called phased arrays. And I led a team of uh, people to, to really put the first phased array in this particular commercial phased array in orbit. Um, and uh, two reasons uh, motivated me. One is that uh, and during that time, I worked on something like uh, one way or the other, whether I was a design engineer for one of the components or or led the entire team, or uh, was responsible for the entire engineering department as a director of spacecraft design. Um, we we were building these very awe-inspiring, sophisticated, large geostationary satellites um, that have served both commercial and government markets uh, uh, for uh, decades. You know, since uh, shortly after Sputnik was launched, uh, the division that I started working uh, working at. 
uh, was established and we were building these uh, geostationary satellites and they became larger and larger because if you're going to launch a rocket, uh, you want to maximize the space um, and uh, an efficiency of the rocket. And so satellites became larger. They became, as they became more expensive, they became more redundant. Uh, we had to make them last longer. So by the time I left, uh, our satellites were lasting and they're designed for 15 to 18 years of on-orbit life. And um, they um, were lasting more than that, obviously, to 30 years. And, and you look at the design cycle of a satellite, could be a couple of years, could be three, could be five, could be seven. If it's a military contract, could be sometimes seven to 10 years. And so imagine if a satellite is up there for t more than 20 years and the design cycle is 10 years and the chips that went into it are not, you know, they weren't designed yesterday. So they're five-year-old technology. So sometimes you look at a satellite technology that uh, are 30, 40 years old. And, and I looked at this and I was like, you know, sometimes some of these uh, defense satellites uh, or warfighters are using a technology that 30, 40 years, that's, that's 30 to 40 years. It just kind of didn't make sense to me that uh, we should refresh the technology cycle and we should make satellites smaller and faster and get them to orbit faster. And okay, maybe they only last five years. Maybe they, they don't have to be as uh, redundant. Uh, such that we can make the technology refresh faster. And I always thought that was a more efficient way of doing it, uh, even though, like I said, these large satellites are quite... And, and what I'm saying now is obviously, it's very obvious to all of us in this sort of space 2.0, but it wasn't obvious back then. But I started becoming very fascinated with this idea of smaller satellites, regardless of whether it's in low-Earth orbit or medium or geo-orbit. The second idea... Uh, was to, to answer your question about phase arrays, because phase arrays is not a common terminology. And so I want to give you some context before I say what active phase arrays are. So the second idea was that when I first started, and I remember the first time that I saw one of the antennas that we had uh, on the satellite. And these antennas are shaped a certain way. They're rippled a certain way to shape the beam. And a beam is kind of like a uh, a cell footprint in our terrestrial uh, cellular infrastructure. Uh, when you are in a beam, in, in, so you can imagine it uh, as, a, as a flashlight and that's illuminating an area. When you are in that area of the flashlight, uh, you can uh, correspond with the cell tower at a certain frequency and you're receiving and transmitting while we're in that area. And you're, when you're out of it, you're in a different uh, frequency or you have no reception at all. Satellites are the same way. You're you're illuminating part of the Earth with this beam that gives you this reception. And these rippled antennas are designed in these fixed traditional dishes such that they cover a geographical area uh, within which a particular provider has a license. And so, for example, a lot of these broadcast satellites for like Dish Network or uh, Direct TV, uh, the beam may be shaped like the U.S. map. So you don't... Um, spill over to Canada or Mexico or the ocean, you want to you broadcast. And so, and that was great for many decades because uh, signals from HBO or uh, the national uh, news networks or whatever could be brought, uh, could be uplinked and then downlinked to the entire company, which is great. But then I started thinking about, but that's really not practical as we transition to the age of the internet where we're all trying to make connectivity work and we want point to point connectivity and we want our data to be sent to us. You can imagine if you want to, you were going to use a, such a system for broadcasting, it wouldn't work very well because if I'm downloading a page, that entire signal, my data has to be broadcast to the entire country so I can receive it in Austin, Texas. And, and so if uh, 300 million people wanted to have their own downloads, you would saturate the beam, you'd have uh, saturate the bandwidth and it wouldn't work. Sure. So, I is, there a power, is there a power constraint also on the yeah, satellite? Sure, there's so much power that, you know, power is related to the amount of data that you can put through a satellite and so on. So, so I started thinking about, and we, of course, we were developing technologies at the time to, to give us spot beams and so on. We were also developing technologies um, around the technologies that allow you to electronically shape the beam, um, make the beams uh, shape to a certain area, and then electronically steer the beam so it can reuse this, uh, this frequency. You reuse this natural resource called spectrum uh, and also put the data where the customers are. And that's the first time I really uh, thought about phased arrays being so powerful and being a, a general purpose technology that will revolutionize and transform uh, not only our industry in space, but also everything that's mobile. 
Uh, and you can see the results. You can see that we've transitioned from the first generation, then to second, to third, fourth generation, 4G LTE, and now 5G and beyond, and 6G are introducing phased array, multi-antenna, multi-beam technologies, even in the cellular infrastructure. And soon you will see it that this will be an essential part of connected car, connected aircraft, and everything in between. Okay, let me uh, l- let me try to put what you've said in in layman's terms, or even further layman's terms, right? And tell me if I'm if I'm thinking about this right. And I, and I did a little bit of background reading here, so I'm I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna admit to that. So um, when you think about just general like waves, electromagnetic waves, you know, you're talking like let's a general antenna, right? It transmits the same amount of power in in all different directions, right? And the example that I've read about or seen is like, yeah, I don't know, you think about a light bulb, right? Obviously, power emitting in all different directions, usually in the same quantity. Or, um, you know, if you want to think about it visually for the folks, you know, listening, of course, like if you, you know, if you um, drop a water um, uh, on a uh, hitting like a still lake, right? And the ripple, and it's like, a, you know, a ripple that's uniform, circular, and that 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 you know waves across the water in all different directions. Um, that's and, and now kind of taking your example, right? That's not what you might always want, right? There's a lot of inefficiency from doing it in that in that way. You may want a very concentrated and narrow beam of waves or electromagnetic waves, right? Especially if you're talking about radar, right? Radar is a good example. You're sending out a you're sending out a wave, and, and if you are broadcasting in all different directions, what's getting bounced back might not be the object you're trying to track. Right. So that's 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 what I've learned so far. But I'm kind of I, I think I'm on the right track, Shay. <laughs> you're very much on the right track. I mean, I, I think your light a- a- analogy is uh, quite correct. If you uh, have a light bulb in the ceiling, for example, even though that's sort of um, not quite isotropic, meaning that uh, a typical ideal antenna might be an isotropic point source that the light emanates from that point source in all directions. Right. And that may be great in some applications, uh, but in re- realistic terms, uh, like in a, in a room, a light bulb in the ceiling illuminates the entire room. But what if, what if you had uh, the same amount of energy uh, and instead of illuminating the entire room, you wanted to focus that beam uh, kind of like a flashlight? Yep. Uh, into one spot. And that's what flashlights, quite honestly, do. Flashlights have a bulb, and then behind it, you've seen a little mirror that focuses the beam into a cylindrical narrow beam uh, that right. you can put a spot on something. Antennas work exactly the same way because light is exactly the same thing. It's an electromagnetic wave, radio waves. Right. And, um, and uh, antennas allow you to uh, make the beam, instead of being broad and, uh, and, uh, and spherical, Directional, and that's called an antenna gain. And right. all antennas do that. The traditional dish antennas on your roof are doing exactly that. They're concentrating the beam towards a certain object, like the geostationary right. satellite. And, and, and generally, generally speaking, is it the so? I think it's the larger the antenna, the narrower that yes, you can make the beam and the wave, right? That's right. But that's not necessarily always practical, right? Having yeah. because maybe it's I mean, not as it's not steerable. Maybe I'll. I'll I'll, I'll use that term and, and throw it back to you because I think that's ultimately one of the key, um, uh, you know, uh, pieces of technology that you offer um, so that you can, you don't, you know, f- like uh, the end customer doesn't have to have a gigantic, you know, antenna in their backyard. Yeah, to be clear, um, to be clear, uh, all antennas provide you a, a directivity, make, make a beam, and the larger the ante- antenna, uh, the narrower the beam and the more right. gain. It's called gain or directivity. That means more okay. of yep. the photons uh, uh, are uh, directed in one area. And whether you have a fixed antenna or you have a phased array antenna, that gain is the same and it's only proportional to the size of the antenna. In other words, uh, in other words phased arrays don't give you uh, more gain uh, than a traditional antenna. Because the size of the antenna drives the gain and the size of the beam and how many uh, uh, photons you're directing in that way. What phase the rays do give you is the steer, steering, ca- electronic steering capability and shaping sure. and being able to create multiple narrow beams from the same aperture. That seems very simple, but it's extremely powerful, extremely, extremely powerful and creates so much better usage uh, of this um, antenna technology. To your point, if you have a physical antenna that's not searable, 
and you want to uh, connect to a low Earth orbit satellite that is going overhead in a couple of minutes, uh, you would have to have a couple of mechanical antennas that are tracking the satellite, and then the second one has to tr- get the next one and then track yep. it, and then the second one has to get in position. And you're doing this all day, and so you can see the me- mechanical components can break down. And that's just one advantage of an electronically steer- steerable beam, not to mention that in the case of radar, for example, trying to track multiple missiles or multiple uh, enemy aircraft wouldn't be possible with mechanically steerable dishes. You really want to have phased arrays to create multiple beams and track many things. And you can use that same radar technology in communications. We're going to use it in 5G and 6G applications. So that's the fundamental. And, and just one more point, because you made an example of dropping sort of a pebble in a pond. Uh, phased arrays are really, it's, I, I really believe that's a good example. If you drop a pebble, pebble in the pond, you'll see that the waves uh, emanate from that uh, uh, pebble outward in all directions. And if you drop two pebbles at the same time, you'll see that some of those waves constructively add in the middle and you sort of get this gain. Uh, and in other areas, they destructively add. So, so you get more of the uh, larger Maybe waves in one direction. Like cancel, certain areas of waves cancel each other out and certain areas it gets more concentrated. That's correct. And then right. now if you adjust the timing between the two pebbles, uh, I drop this and then drop it just a little bit, a fraction you of a second later, you can see the change the direction of the wave. And that's yeah. exactly how phased array antenna elements work. I see. Okay. So let's, let, let's, talk, um, let's talk a little bit about use cases, right? Because um, from uh, my uh, just high level kind of uh, research is what I'll, what, what I'll say. It sounds like phased array antennas have been in use for quite some time, right? Um, but 80, it sounds like more than eighty years. Eighty years. Yeah, and the original use case was military. Yes. Right. So tracking, you know, tracking missiles. Um, you know, I'm sure there are, or, or I'm sure there's kind of missile timing mechanisms that were used that were that phased arrays were used for. Um, tell me, let's talk a little bit about sort of like you know original use cases of phased array antennas and like where you see the market going and where there's going to be more, uh, maybe a bigger market than what we had even in the past. They've been used since its inception for both communication and radar. They've been used in AM radio, trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, direct, uh, direct the waves in one direction. They've been used in radar, as you mentioned. They've been used in the nose cones of jet fighters for many years uh, in, on ships uh, for uh, tracking uh, incoming missiles and, and defending the ship and so on. Uh, there's just many, many applications and, and in communication as well. They've been used in communi- telecommunication and communication for, uh, for creating these multiple steerable beams. Um, and the technology, the issue was, and, and one of the uh, reasons for wanting to f- found cesium was that this technology was always considered uh, a very niche uh, sort of application. Uh, phase arrays, um, uh, you know, sort of the law of conservation of complexity. When you get this steerable multi beams, there's a price to pay. It it, uh, it may consume more power. It may require more electronics to make it happen. Obviously, and it was always considered that the phase arrays are much more expensive unless I absolutely need them. It, you can never beat uh, a traditional uh, gimbal dish antenna. Okay, that may be true, but it's no longer quite true. Um, in most cases, the advent of technologies, you know, in our in our a cellular infrastructure uh, for 4G, LTE, and beyond, 5G, and so on, and as well as technologies in amplifiers, things that the components that you need in a phase array, amplifiers, low noise amplifiers, uh, uh, really took a different turn uh, over the past 15 or 20 years. With again, with the advent of uh, advanced cellular technologies like 4G, 4G LTE, and 5G, and then also crash avoidance technologies for automobiles. And created chips and chip technologies and and uh, uh, systems that can now be uh, that that can be used uh, efficiently and inexpensively using building phased arrays. And really, that's what we wanted to do. I, I, I wanted to build a company that once and for all commercializes what what I said this bespoke technology, where traditionally this was built by traditional prime defense contractors, very custom design sometimes costing, costing hundreds of millions of dollars for these systems to be developed and then built into a system. What I wanted to do was commercialize this such that it's like Lego building blocks 
that a range of frequencies, range of applications can be served that our customers can use and build, put these building blocks together. And it's a, and a system that works right out of the box, uh, that is truly plug and play. I mean, that, that terminology is really used loosely in many applications, but true plug and play means that a, a sophisticated system has to come out of the box and work for our customers. Uh, and I'd yep. like to give you an example of that. So, so um, uh, Shay, uh, help me understand the cost, the magnitude in drop in costs. The reason why the technology has really been able to proliferate now, obviously, thanks mm-hmm. to what you're building and what you're doing, has been that cost equation. Like many things in yes. the space industry, yes. they've come down yes. significantly. Yes. How, yes. how how yes. big has that drop in cost been now? For that- space, it's been for space, it's been an order of magnitude easily. I mean, we are. Uh, every week we're submitting a proposal and we have one project that uh, compared to 20 years, 30 years ago, if, if you were going to bid the same thing and really provide the same exact capability, uh, we are bidding and winning projects uh, that are easily an order of magnitude l- less cost than what was possible. Uh, and uh, again, the, these chip technologies that once uh, a single chip because it was so custom designed and built in such low quantities for space that may have costed you know ten thousand dollars or something uh, it can be purchased now for uh, you know a hundred dollars or less and uh, and and when you put it all together as a system and especially with the work that we have done at cesium astro to really build these lego lego building blocks such that uh, we don't really transfer the non-recurring effort or the or the cost of the design to our customers uh, the cost has dropped by an order of magnitude. And then f- from there, if you want to go for aircraft connectivities, the phased array that are looking up uh, to connect to the satellite, the flat, ar- uh, the flat panel mm-hmm. arrays, as you know, that's another order mm-hmm. of magnitude. And then from there, if you want to put a phased array ultimately uh, on a car or on a roof or, uh, uh, or you know, it, it has to be another order of magnitude. So uh, if you really think about it, phased array technologies it is not possible in high enough quantities to be built at, as, at one, two, or three orders of magnitude compared to 25 years ago, or 20 years ago, I should say. So um, I saw an article uh, titled, Phased Array Antennas Are Satellites Holy Grail. What do you think I, of I that agree. statement? <laughs> I think it is. I mean, I, it, it's, I think it's this, I think it's a, Holy Grail for certainly for uh, communication satellites. That's that's for sure. Uh, I mean, uh, I absolutely believe it. Whether it's Geo, Mio, or Leo, I really think phased arrays uh, are are one of those technologies. Uh, you know, I call them general purpose technologies. One of those technologies that, like transistor, steam engine, and things that, when they absolutely become commercialized, uh, they will have massive impact in the industry. And phased arrays have already done that in many aspects for uh, for telecommunication satellites. And I think uh, for other types of satellites as well. I mean, even if you have a Earth observation satellite and you want to download a lot of data, uh, if you have uh, uh, SAR applications, uh, a s- synthetic aperture radar type application, you mm-hmm. already know that phased arrays are an essential requirement for them, essentially. So, so I think that the this, this statement is, is true, and uh, I, I believe in it. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the products, like you know. If you were to just describe to an investor, like what are the products or your customer? What are your pro- like? What are the main products that Cesium offers today? So Cesium offers a very uh, we call a full stack product, uh, and I and I was I was going to mention to you that what do we mean by plug and play? Right? Uh, I mean plug and play is a, almost a, a very overused statement, but very under delivered mm-hmm. statement. Uh, there, you know. Today, we expect it, right? When you go buy a laptop uh, and bring it home, you go to Best Buy or something, buy a laptop or a computer, you bring it home, you expect it that, you know, it, it comes with everything you need. You plug it in. It should have software. It should be able to. But it wasn't always like that. You know, you bought a computer, then you had to go to another aisle and get some more disks and get some adapters, bring it home, and you're trying to download something. Oh, no, nope, I got to get that driver. Then I got to do that. Then I got to do this. And sure. it really it took several, many, many years to become truly plug and play. And in our industry, uh, if I built a phased array and I gave it to a company that wants to, are focusing on building a, a air taxi, <laughs> an EVTOL system, 
their focus is on building the EV toll and make sure it's reliable and works. The last thing in their mind is to be antenna and RF engineers and try to figure out how this thing works. Yep. And even today, most companies that do this kind of stuff give you a phase there, but what am I going to do with it now? I mean, I got to go figure out how to. We wanted to build a product that when I ship it to you, uh, even if it's a sophisticated customer or not, you can install it on a satellite aircraft or whatever, and you have an Ethernet cable, you have a power cable, and it should everything else should work flawlessly. And if it's going to look up, uh, it should automatically find the satellite and with a few uh, GUI interfaces uh, walk you through. That was our goal, to build a, a Lego-like product suite that works from uh, frequencies, uh, sub-gigahertz, all the way up to 60, 70 gigahertz. And unfortunately, antennas are not software defined yet. So antennas, you have to have a very efficient, which is what we have. We have a very efficient mm -hmm. proprietary antenna, um, but they are different for different frequencies. And then we have a software defined backend. And what, is, what, I, what do I mean by backend? Backend means you cannot connect to an antenna with an RF signal. You really have to have an Ethernet port that you put digital data, data in it. So our products are this Lego-like, multi-use, multi-application, meaning satellites, aircraft, uh, drones, and hopefully very soon. We just introduced our aircraft uh, product uh, uh, a few weeks ago at the satellite show in Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, at the Space Symposium uh, mm -hmm. that's coming up next week. And, um, and so and pretty soon we will have also a ground terminal version of this as well. So our products are a host of phase arrays with all the electronics, all the software, all the algorithms, all the waveforms that our customers need that works out of the box. And they don't need to have their own RF PhDs and antenna PhDs. That's the way I like to put it in uh, <laughs> normal terms. No, that makes a lot of sense. Who are the types of, uh, who are your kind of um, initial, what's your, what does your initial customer base look like? Yes. Uh, you know, as a startup, obviously, uh, you know, again, uh, we're very lucky that uh, we have programs in this country that allow companies uh, like us to flourish. So we've had initially a lot of customers in the Department of Defense, uh, various agencies. We've had several good NASA customers uh, who have uh, either funded us or we've developed, co-developed things with them and shipped them products. So and now we've had several commercial customers uh, as well. You know, uh, uh, we're working on a project that we announced with Airbus uh, for aircraft connectivity. We have uh, programs. Uh, uh, we just got down selected by a company called Saturn, which is a micro geo uh, company uh, to build our direct radiating phased arrays, AESAs, uh, for a geo application uh, uh, with the entire system on a geo application. And we have a range of customers. And we're ev even involved in uh, some uh, automotive applications for connectivity of the future cars, for the autonomy of the future vehicles. So, a range of products from cars to aircraft to drones to satellites lunar missions we're we're partnered with several companies on, on a, a, a few lunar programs um and uh, it, it's pretty much uh, on missiles uh on drones, everything, everything you can imagine that's <laughs> it <laughs> it's all very exciting um and i want to i want to dive uh, i want to dive in a little bit um into uh how do you uh think about that market sizing if we were to put some dollars behind it but before we do that I, we do need to take a quick break um, yep. for a quick message from our sponsors. Space is the new frontier for cybersecurity. To quote the commander of the U.S. Space Force's Operations Command, cyber threats are unfortunately the soft underbelly of our global space networks. SpiderOak, the leader in space cybersecurity software, is dedicated to providing space operators with the solutions they need to protect hybrid space systems. Their Orbit Secure software uses a unique combination of end-to-end -end zero trust encryption and blockchain distributed ledger, allowing missions to orchestrate and secure Earth-to-orbit, orbit-to-Earth transmission, communication, and storage of sensitive data across even the most complex and unsecure LEO and hybrid space systems. To learn how Orbit Secure can bring zero trust security and resiliency to your zero gravity environments, check out SpiderOak at www.spideroak.com. Shay, welcome back. So uh, the last uh, the last thing we left off with was the uh, numerous uh, use cases and customers that you were uh, attacking and looking after. So mm -hmm. um, let's uh, let's let's talk a little bit about that. Um, when, when you started this company, 
was this a, hey, this is a really important challenge. I really want to solve it. I'm very passionate about this challenge. Mm -hmm. Um, Or was it a, damn, this is a really big market and there's a lot of money to be made? A combination of both. Tell me a little bit about that. And then we can talk a bit about, you know, how big this market actually is and how do you size it from a, from, from a dollar's perspective. Um, would be curious to get your thoughts on both those. No, I think mo- it was mostly around uh, those who know me know that, uh, you know, certainly, as, as I said, phase to raise, uh, I've been around for a long time. And uh, certainly, I didn't invent phase to raise. <laughs> but I've been passionate about phase to raise for a long time. Like I said, the, the history and the impetus for the company around uh, smaller satellites versus large bespoke satellites uh, agile beams and agile telecommunication technologies have always fascinated me. I've always fa- been fascinated by, uh, by products that are agile and software defined. And uh, so that was the reason uh, for my passion for the company because I wanted, I just couldn't understand why uh, this technology is not, t- maybe the timing wasn't right, as I said, maybe the chip technology hadn't caught up. Uh, and, and I felt the time was finally right. And I believe that's now proven that the timing is perfect because honestly, there aren't that many companies that actually do what we do. That's why we've just been overwhelmed with the amount of demand uh, that we have had. Uh, we're, we're only limited, uh, by the amount of talent we can hire and scaling the company. We're not limited by the number of customers who are knocking down our door every, every single day, every single week. That, so it just is shows that. that now, so I, I was going to say, is that is that because of the approach and kind of what you mentioned before, the plug and play model, the ability for folks that don't have, um, you know, PhD yeah. in RF technology or, you know, engineers yeah. that focus on that? Is, is, is that I sort of the key? Of the I think it's all, all of the above. I think, yeah, it is, is, it is the approach we've taken. We, we, can, we provide a complete solution that works uh, for many applications, for many environments. When I say applications, right? Environments for space are very different. You know, in, in space, you have radiation and different kinds of thermal environments. And aircraft, you have a completely different set of environments for a car, cost is everything and so on and so forth. And so we were able to create a product that is really applicable to multiple applications and really allows our customers to get the best price and size, weight and power and cost. Um, and, uh, and furthermore, it is not just that, it's the fact that it is the time now for mobile applications to have the maximum amount of uh, throughput speed uh, for, uh, for the connectivity of their customers. So uh, that's why if you, if you want all of the above and you want to be able to connect to these low Earth orbit constellations of the future or geo, you want phase the rate technologies on these platforms of the future. You no longer can. I mean, if you've seen the little bubbles on top of the aircraft. I mean, th- you know, the, having mechanical dishes tracking uh, large geo satellites is really not the way to go. Uh, and so it's, that's being replaced. On the satellites being replaced, so it's both. It's both our, both our technology and the timing for the industry to, to want this technology. Let me, uh, l- let me j- just to give like the listeners a sense of like the, the magnitude of the importance of phased array antennas. If phased array technology let's just make this up, did not exist, um, would Starlink work? Uh, not really. Not, not the way it does. I mean, even, even Iridium, uh, probably the only uh, successful LEO constellation, very uh, respectable company, uh, the, relied on phase array technology at the lower frequencies. And so, I, I mean, could you make it work? Uh, sure, in some way. But it would, it would be nowhere near the performance uh, and uh, that, that that you get it, it really at right. least for lower lower orbit, it just wouldn't work very well. Right. How, how do you ensure uh, a tech, uh, that a technology like this doesn't get commoditized, so that you know some uh, other player comes and just builds it at scale? Well, a I just I do want it to be uh, commoditized, <laughs> commoditized yeah. in a way. I, I really do want it to be where it is absolutely. Uh, in everything and every platform, uh, I, I don't. That, that's the whole idea of my company. I don't want it to be a bespoke technology. But we do have uh, lots and lots of IP and lots of patents and lots of algorithms and software that makes us very unique. And and what we have right now, we believe we're several years ahead of many competing technologies, and we will maintain that edge. You know, I think I think uh, I could give you a number of examples. Uh, 
uh, are Apple's, uh, is Apple's uh, iPhone uh, commoditized? Are there competitors? Sure. But uh, they have an amazing product and, and they're staying ahead. And, and that's what I want to yeah. do with my company. I want to stay ahead of the competition. So let, let's uh, talk a little bit. Let's bring your kind of experience into this. Like, so having worked at a prime and then a new mm-hmm. space startup and then your own yeah. startup, what are mm-hmm. some of the things where you're like, you know, over the course of those many years that you've worked at, um, uh, you know, a variety of different, um, you know, or number of different companies where you're like, here's how I'd run a business and here's how I wouldn't run a business. So like, what are some of those learnings that you've been able to apply to Cesium? overworking at, uh, you know, both a prime and also a startup? Excellent question. Uh, I think, uh, I think each type of a company, uh, provides uh, a certain type of experience and advantage or disadvantage. Uh, and I think working at a large company, uh, uh, even though large companies also have ups and downs and so on, but working at a large company, the future is more certain, uh, uh, certainly, uh, those are profitable companies and, uh, uh, and established businesses. Um, and, uh, you can do a lot of great things. I did a lot of great things. Uh, I was, uh, I was very lucky to work with an incredible number of, uh, talented individuals and access to so much talent that, uh, so that's really good. But, but smaller companies, uh, give you this direct connection to your end customer, whether you're the CEO of the company, or you're just an engineer out of college. Uh, some of our engineers, we're a 140 person company right now. And some of our engineers who just started, they may find themselves in front of a NASA customer, uh, uh four weeks from now. <laughs> Direct right. connection to what they do, how it impacts uh, cesium business, how it impacts our customer. They hear directly from the customer. And, um, and I really think that's very special. I think I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to be an entrepreneur because I was always that guy who, besides the space, what fascinated me was companies like Hewlett Packard and, and Lockheed Martin and Motorola and these uh, companies like Apple that, that, that a few people, a couple of people out of a garage built an industry, built an amazing company. Uh, that was the biggest motivator in my, my life, my entire life. Uh, uh, and I could tell you stories about it, that uh, building a company that hopefully can grow and long after I'm gone, uh, become a company that builds technologies and advances the technologies in a number of areas has been the most rewarding uh, part of my life. Not to say that the other things are not, but every one of them gives you a different experience. And if you're the kind of guy, kind of person who wants this, wants this uh, challenge, and it is very, very challenging, yep. um, then then. This is the kind of thing. I don't know if I answered your question, but I hope I did. No, you did. You did. Um, and you actually made me think of something else that I that I wanted to ask you, which is why did you choose Austin to build the company? Because you know, you you know, obviously LA LA is an LA is a natural place. You know, there's clearly tons of space companies out there. Denver, there's a, no, a number of other business, a number of other places you could have easily have chosen. So why Austin? You know, I always thought about if I ever wanted to start a company. Uh, what are the two cities that I would really like to be in? And uh, one was Austin, the other one was Denver. Uh, and it's funny enough that our headquarters are in Austin and our second largest uh, division is in Broomfield, Colorado, outside of Denver. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. I think Austin, uh, when I moved here 13 years ago, was an amazing, and it still is an amazing place. I mean, the cost of living was lower. It has gone up since, but the cost of living was lower. It's a beautiful, beautiful city. It's an amazing lifestyle. And, uh, and it just has a lot of talent, uh, UT Austin, um, uh, you have Texas A&M, lots of universities, lots of great people, lots of young people, lots of, uh, uh, talent. It's just a vibrant, vibrant city that, that, that is affordable. And I felt that, and by the way, Austin, uh, for years was called the Silicon Hills. So there are lots and lots of amazing companies that were already established here in Austin. And so I thought, wow, what a place, uh, to begin this new chapter uh, of, yeah. uh, of being an, an entrepreneur. Um, and it, it was really that. I mean, of course, LA and Silicon Valley are fantastic as well. But, you know, the cost of living for a young engineer is more challenging than uh, at least when it was here in Austin 10 years ago. No, ab- absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I, I love Austin. I'm, I'm, I'm there actually uh, very frequently. And, and 
uh, yeah, it's a great town and there's a growing space community there, which is also very exciting yeah. to see. Uh, so l- let's uh, switch gears for just um, the last, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes that we have. Um, I-, I do want to talk a little bit about sort of the macro um, environment. And, you know, mm-hmm. we don't have to spend time talking about the challenges because, you know, it is a challenging macro environment for a lot of different reasons. Sure. And it's been challenging for fundraising for a lot of companies that are coming back sure. to the market. Um, my question for you really is um, advice to founders who are building highly technical, complex systems, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that where that sexy story, like building mm-hmm. a rocket, isn't obvious. Mm-hmm to investors, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? You have to yeah. really, you have to build, you have to like, h- how do you, what are some, um, I mean, I can only imagine the early complexities of marketing a product like yours to fo- yeah. to non-technical investors, right? Who, yeah. you know, you're trying to convince like, this is the vision, this is the story, this is what we're going to do. Like, how, how, mm-hmm. like any advice on how other founders who are building, you know, something like this, h- how do they navigate that environment? How do they tell that story? And how did you tell that story? How did I tell the story? I mean, I think, um, you know, b- before I answer that question, may I just first, an- I think you, answer, you asked the question that, that that's important as well. If I may answer that first and then sure. how did I tell that story? You know, because you mentioned earlier before the break also that, you know, rockets are very sexy and they indeed are. Uh, they're just amazing. Uh, it was a time of my life as an electrical engineer to be the CTO of a rocket company because I had to learn a lot. Uh, from our CEO, who was one of the most brilliant engineers I met. And, uh, and it was amazing. It was really amazing. But the problem is, was in my mind that how many people can actually, uh, raise that kind of money? It takes hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars before you can actually sell the right. I mean, obviously rockets, uh, uh, take several tries to be successful. And that's perfectly normal. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a tough, uh, product. And how many people can raise that kind of money and, and have investors that are patient enough to, to wait to finally make it and actually make some money? So my approach was that building from bottoms up might be easier. A lot of people might think, well, look, I want to get into space business. I believe making money out of satellites is great because I just want to be in the data business. I want to sell the end data. That's more profitable. So, okay, mm-hmm. so a couple of smart guys. Um, start a satellite company. Uh, I want to build a constellation of 600 satellites. Okay, great. I have my people. I want to go raise them. All I have to do now is raise $3 billion. Well, that's, yeah. that's kind of hard. <laughs> and I have to raise a few more billion dollars before it's profitable. I felt, it, uh, you know, cash is the fuel for the company. Without cash, there is no company. There is no, uh-huh. no matter how quixotic or how idealistic you are about the future, you have to have cash to build a company. So I felt building a system that I can sell to many, many customers, both commercial and defense, across multiple platforms, satellites, drones, and so on, may not be as sexy. I think it is sexy. I think it's incredibly challenging, but allows me to build a business and be very profitable first. Right. And then if I want to move up the food chain, build a satellite around it so I can uh, sell uh, a larger system, I can do that. Or at some point, I can do something else or build a bigger system. I, I thought from ground up is much more efficient. That's exactly what we did. Uh, We built from ground up. That's why the amount of money we have raised, in fact, more than half of it, all the venture money that we have raised, more than half of it is still in the bank. So we can survive through this macroeconomic condition. We've been very cash efficient six and a half years into this business. We've never run out of cash. We're very successful business. It's all because of this ground up approach rather than saying, I want to build the sexiest thing in the world. And how did I present it to investors and people? To investors, this was my story, that I believe this is a better way uh, to enter the market and to, uh, and, and we're always going to, well, our goal is to be the best phase rate company. As far as answering uh, to c- potential customers, this very technical, very detailed technology, that's exactly why I was talking about building a product that doesn't require that much explanation. Um, I wanted to build a product that I can just tell them, let me worry about it, and I'll deliver you a product that does exactly what you want. In fact, that's many of our customers that call us and that have built, uh, have purchased our products don't know much about telecommunication systems, phase arrays, or RF or antenna. We take care of the entire concept of operations for their system. We tell them, we ask a few questions, 
They answer it, and then we take it from there. And within the next couple of years, I'm actually automating this answer and question such that mm-hmm. you can go to our website. You can say, I got a satellite that wants to talk to a drone uh, and then so on and so forth. And the website itself will build a system for you and say, okay, you want a phased array that has this many tiles and this much. So really, I, I think about it that way. Uh, and that's the way I market it, marketed our products. And that's the way we're marketing our products. It's a fully self-contained system you can, you can attach to your platform. So uh, I was uh, visiting your booth at the satellite conference in DC uh, a few yeah. weeks ago. And I was actually talking to Alex on your team, um, yeah. Alex Johnson, yeah. who's obviously, yeah. you know, she's done a great job on all the marketing and comms side of, of both, awesome. uh, what awesome. you're building. Yeah. So yeah. Um, one of the things we were talking about was like how sexy the product is, right? We were talking about yes. sexy rockets, yes. but you know, for, for anyone who goes on your website and they see the actual product that you're selling you know it's gold and black and it looks beautiful so i i I have to like in all seriousness like you know in a tip tip my hat off to you for actually like building a product that looks very like looks great looks very cool thank you thank you that wasn't yeah who was that who's the who's the branding genius behind that (laughs) it's not branding it's us uh i I am a deep believer in uh product design i mean form fit and function are all important uh uh you know, we, you and I could talk a lot about this. There's a, there's a, if you ever get a chance, there's a program, I think it was years ago and it was on, I think it was on PBS, but there's a program on the, on the award of the Joint Strike Fighter F-35 uh, between Lockheed Martin and Boeing. And I, and I encourage you to, to watch it on a jet fighter. Why would jet fighter, how it looks matter? It's just a jet fighter that has certain requirements, but it doesn't, does matter and it mattered a lot. Because human beings are the ones who select this, and human beings, pilots, have to go fly this. And I want you to watch that program. In fact, I think you should Google uh, <laughs> uh, F-35 uh, selection, and I think you understand. But I've always been passionate about product design. Yeah. I believe this is why Apple became Apple. And, uh, and, I, and I think uh, when I look at products that are well thought through, when you buy some of these products and everything from the packaging all the way to the, to the way the adapters uh, wrapped around. When you look at a Ducati motorcycle, when you look at certain cars, some people might not realize it, but product design is extremely important. And I'm extremely passionate about it. That's why I have an industrial design, a very, very uh, talented industrial designer on my staff reporting directly to me because that's how much product design matters to me. Shay, I can, I, I can tell that you're genuinely the, you're, you're very genuine about this because I feel like you're about to jump out of the screen talking to me about product design. <laughs> no, but uh, no, I think it makes it makes a ton of sense, and and it and it does really it does really make a difference. Um, so in the last few minutes, I have I just have a few questions that we could just spend uh, a little bit of time on each. Um, if you weren't uh, building active phased array antennas, what would you be building? Uh, if I were not building active phased array antennas, what would I be building? Uh, uh, if I were not, uh, I, I like active phase ant- antennas. I like satellites. I like spacecraft. I like Earth orbiting satellites. Uh, I mean, of course, I like lunar missions and going to Mars. And uh, human beings are uh, someday becoming a multiplanetary uh, species, of course. But I'm more interested in uh, in things that make life better on Earth. Uh, I really am interested about uh, in that. I'm really interested in in the proliferation of uh, information around the earth and 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 i believe what ultimately will bring about uh peace uh and elimination of racism and hatred is uh knowledge and enlightenment Mm -hmm. i don't know if there's any other industry i'd love to be part of i think telecommunication is uh really in my dna and uh there's one other interest i have if i wasn't doing this from the beginning of my career i wish uh I could have had two lives where my second life would have been in robotics. Uh, yeah. uh, I, I, love, uh, I love robots and humanoid robots uh, and AI, of course, AI and machine learning. I, actually, this wasn't going to be my next question, but since you brought that up, are there any uh, movies or books out there that fit into that theme that you're particularly passionate about? Uh, um, movies? Uh, I don't know. I have to think about it uh, or, or, or books. Uh, uh, I'll have to think about it. I don't have one off the top of my head. I've been you, heads we'll, down. We'll give you a pass on that one. We'll give you a pass on that one. Uh, so uh, oh, yeah. 
what's another, I actually ask this to every, every, basically every person that comes on the show, what's another company in the space industry that you deeply respect or perhaps a startup that you think has very big things ahead of it? Wow, that's a great question. I mean, obviously, uh, obviously, I think, and I don't want to make it just about, uh, you know, I actually don't like the term new space versus old space. There's no such thing. I think Mm -hmm. uh, there would be no new space company without the old space or the traditional people to to do everything that we have done, uh, including my own experience. Um, But certainly what SpaceX has done is incredibly fascinating. It's incredibly uh, inspiring. Uh, inspiring and um, and um, uh, and and there are lots of startups, uh, you know, in all sorts of areas. Uh, the, I was just talking to a company that uh, we're working with. They're building the next generation low cost solar arrays, um, and I think they're extremely important. Uh, uh, for example, Empower is the name of the company, and there are others, uh, Celestial and others. Um, I think solar arrays again. It's not super sexy, but it's so important. It's sure. so incredibly important in the future. Uh, um, there are electric propulsion companies. That there are uh, all aspects of it. I'm trying to think of one other startup, perhaps, that I really think uh, and respect. Uh, you know, um, start, um, small rocket companies like Rocket Lab and Firefly and others are very respectable. Um, uh, satellite companies, um, um, you know, companies, uh, I'm trying to think of who, who can I think of in the small satellite companies? Um, there's Terran, Orbital, there's York, there's a bunch of them. I, I really like this new sort of space 2.0 is a better term, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, good, good. So um, last question. Um, we can talk about this last question for a very long time, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to force you into the answer in about a minute. What's, an un- what's another kind of underlying trend or technology that you think that's going to have a massive impact on the space industry? You've touched on a little bit just in that last answer. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's something there. But is there something else that you're watching or maybe you don't think people are paying nearly enough attention to? In this space, uh, in the, in this space sort of revolution going forward, mm-hmm. I think I did answer it. But, uh, but, but I think, you know, like I said, what do we want? Uh, by the way, one thing I didn't say, and I hope uh, you don't cut this portion out because it's really, really important to me. It's not a plug. It's not a plug. I, I deeply, deeply respect one of our customers, uh, one of our DOD customers called, called the Space Development Agency uh, and their mission uh, to put this uh, proliferated uh, 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 Leo ar- ar- architecture in space. And they've been true to their word. And it's challenging. It's not easy. But I believe uh, by the time they're done, not done, but as they make progress, uh, the defense a- uh, acquisition reform, reform that we've been wanting as an industry will be realized because of what they're doing. And they're one of our customers. Uh, uh, they've been very good to uh, trust us, but I really believe in it. I believe in this sort of cadence of every couple of years putting up a bunch of satellites. And I'm sorry it's not going to take a minute because I have to say this. <laughs> that's, a, um, that's okay. Because if we're going to do this and if we're going to make space something that's accessible and become super successful and it's not just governments and it's not just a few and it's really accessible to all, the cost has to come down. The performance has to go up and the cost has to come down. In order for that to happen, uh, companies like us, companies, different technologies have to make it through this uh, valley of death for startups. And, uh, and I think these are the kind of things we're doing. So technologies that get us there bring the cost of launch down. And, and so companies like SpaceX and others who are bringing the uh, cost of launch down and hopefully, uh, you know, uh, nuclear thermal rocket engines uh, will become reality someday that we could, we go even beyond the starship and, and so on. Uh, uh, as I said, um, the components, uh, us, solar arrays, batteries, uh, star trackers, uh, and uh, all the satellite technologies uh, uh, need to the cost for the cost to come down and the performance to go up. And I think we will have ultimately when the dust clears and we get over some of these orbital debris issues and actually become good citizens in space, uh, we will truly have this proliferated infrastructure in space that makes life better for mankind. I really, be- this wasn't a speech. I really believe that. I really believe through telecommunication, Earth observation, we can make life better on Earth beyond, beyond exploring Mars. I'm more passionate about Earth. 
No, Shay, I, I really appreciate that. I might have the producers go back and put some like uh, inspirational music behind that last answer. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't do that. Please don't do that. It wasn't meant to be that. It wasn't meant to be no, a no, speech. No, it comes from the heart. No, no, I, I, I really appreciate it. And, and your passion really does come through. So uh, look, we're, we're, unfortunately, we're out of time. But I do have to say, um, you know, Shay, thank you for being on the show. Um, and My most pleasure. importantly, you know, you, uh, you, know you, have a, you, you, have, you have two tough jobs, right? One, which is like you're building a very complex, tough technology. And two, you need to help. You need to make sure people understand it and understand the importance of it. Um, and I think yeah. uh, you've done a great job doing that today. Uh, it's certainly not easy. Great. And I remember the first time I was in your office a couple years ago and we were talking about your technology. I left thinking, I got, I have a lot of reading to do, <laughs> right? So, um, Thank you. so uh, yeah, I think you guys have done a great job showcasing how important um, and how valuable the technology is. And, and you know, you, you clearly have done a great job building the business as well. So uh, it was an honor having you on the show. Thank you very much. And obviously you're always welcome anytime. So thanks, Shay. Thank you, Mark. It was my pleasure. Thank you for taking the time. Appreciate it. Of course.